Good evening, you folks out there. Welcome. I'm delighted to be able to do this with you all this evening um, and sponsored by Hogue Hospital. Um, my name is Brian Chesney. I'm a heart doctor, a cardiologist, electrophysiologist. Uh, we'll be joined, I'll be joined by three other amazing cardiac electrophysiologists and talk with you all out there in the community about atrial fibrillation, which is such a common arrhythmia. Um, and we hope that just by having a, a kind of a fireside chat amongst the four of us, we can teach you all a lot about this uh, cardiology heart rhythm problem and maybe give you some reassurance and paint pictures for you of how we take care of things. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for spending the time to, um, to take the time to do this with us. Um, I thought I would start with um, just trying to explain to you what fibrillation is um, and where electrophysiology came from. What is electrophysiology? And electrophysiology is a subset of cardiology, um, which specializes specifically in electrical abnormalities of the heart and heart rhythm disturbances, including atrial fibrillation to sudden death syndromes and things like that. Uh, when I trained, it was in the late 1970s into the early 1980s, and it was pretty much pre-electrophysiology because what we did was work in um, medications and the development of new medications to treat heart arrhythmias, many of which were around sudden death prevention as well as the nuisance arrhythmias of atrial fibrillation. Uh, the world changed in 1991 when uh, Dr. Murawski um, introduced the implantable defibrillator at Johns Hopkins. Um, I had the opportunity of putting my first one in at Auctioner Clinic in 1983. And um, we started doing implantable defibrillator work here at Hogue Hospital in 1988. And in that era, it was a surgical procedure. Um, and uh, we, the chest would be fully opened with the heart exposed. And the surgeons that I worked with at that time were Dr. Aidan Rainey and Dr. Doug Zessman and Dr. Colin Joyo. Um, atrial fib was just in its infancy back then, and in 1990, I became interested and literally traveled every Friday down to San Diego to UCSD um, and started to do um, training and skill sets in um, cardiac ablation. And the first ablations were actually called DC shock ablation, which was the delivery of shocks inside of the heart. And then in 1991, uh, radio frequency catheter ablation came out. And we started the ablation program at Hogue Hospital in 1991. It was the first sophisticated um, electrophysiology lab program in Orange County. And shortly thereafter, Dr. Michael Radin, um, Dr. Manaz Babudika, and Dr. Neela Hunter uh, came uh, to Hogue Hospital. And the four of us were very busy through the 90s um, doing these procedures. Um, and then in the first decade of the, of the tw 21st century, uh, a new generation came along who were very trained and very skilled in high technical development of machinery and approach to the problem. And uh, the first to join us um, is Dr. Michael Radin. I'm sorry, Dr. Michael Panudic, um, followed thereafter by Dr. Raj Banker, and then the latest to join us was Dr. Tafiri Mitiku. And these are very exceptional trained men. Um, they, they had deep dig training through their fellowship years, and they've all been out in practice now for a good number of years and have accumulated a tremendous wealth of experience, both in the management of arrhythmias in general and doing the technical procedural work now in ablation work. And I'm, I do a work with all three of them. I'm very thrilled with their work in general and their skill sets and the nature of their personalities as well. So having said that, um, what is fibrillation? And what is atrial fibrillation? Well, the normal heart, uh, the heartbeat initiates from something called the sinus node in the top right-hand corner of the heart. And I want you to imagine a very fast moving tidal wave, which is an electrical wave that moves right around the upper chambers of the heart, the atria, and then goes down through a funnel called the AV node and then wraps around the ventricles like that very quickly. So normal heart rhythm is 
the electrical mechanical coupling that allows a heart chamber to contract. And in normal rhythm, the upper chambers, the atrium, and the lower chambers, the ventricles, contract in a sequential relationship on a one-to-one -one basis. But when a heart chamber is fibrillating, if I've given you the analogy of a tidal wave moving around quickly and then down and around, I now want you to think of a stormy, choppy ocean where all the waves are colliding into each other and fractionating into further wavelets of increasing degrees of chaos. That's fibrillation. So that with normal rhythm, the ventricles and the atria contract in fibrillation, there's loss of contractility and they quiver just like that. There's no more contraction. So that if the ventricles do that, it's called ventricular fibrillation and it's sudden death which is the most common cause of death in the United States and Canada and Europe. But atrial fibrillation, the ventricles are still contracting though irregularly and sometimes more rapidly, but you live life and many people don't even know they have atrial fibrillation. So that's the nature of the problem of what we're gonna talk about tonight. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Panudic the first question. If what I've just said is the difference of normal heart rhythm, Michael, to atrial fibrillation, how does it affect the heart actually? And what does it do with the heart? So when you go into atrial fibrillation, um, you do lose what we call the atrial kick. So uh, that squeezing function that Dr. Chesney was mentioning um, contributes anywhere from three to 10 or 15 percent of the blood going down into the ventricle, the, which you most likely will feel more when you're exercising, not so much when you're uh, at rest. So you lose that. Um, the other thing is your heart's gonna go irregular and you can go fast. Um, when that happens, that can cause symptoms. You can feel palpitations, you can feel regular heartbeat, you can get shorter breath, uh, you can get chest pain, um, and you can get all different types of symptoms. And so, uh, the, the concerning thing with atrial fibrillation is one, um, we get concerned about the risk of stroke, which we'll go into. If your heart's going too fast and going too fast for too long, you can develop heart failure. So we worry about that. Uh, once those are taken, uh, once those are addressed, then we just look at symptoms. And for people who have symptoms from their AFib, we try to keep them in normal rhythm uh, to make them feel better. Thanks. So Dr. Banker, um, Dr. Panudis just talked about the variety of symptoms. Is there um, a bell curve or is there a scale in terms of the degree of symptoms that people have? Do some people, I mean, are they miserable completely with this or are they aware of it and okay? Um, or are people, how many people walk into your office and they're there to get an EKG for a cataract operation or a knee and they're in atrial fib and they don't even know it? Well, I have a biased sample because most people are seeing me because they have AFib. But, um, you know, the, with that said, there's a good portion of patients, I'd say nearing 50%, who have minimal or no symptoms. Um, and that's largely because they're not really utilizing their atrial kick that much. They don't really need that additional cardiac reserve in their day-to-day -day lives. So they don't feel those symptoms. But we have a, a good portion of patients who are symptomatic and those symptoms do range from mild palpitations to extreme um, palpitations, chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, and even passing out in the rare extreme case. Um, but it really does run the entire spectrum of, uh, of symptomatology. Dr. Matiku, how many people do you see with atrial fibrillation and even with faster heart? You would presume that if the heart rates are slower, they may be less symptomatic, right? But how many people do you see with slower heart rates that are symptomatic? And how many people do you see with more rapid heart rates that are not symptomatic? Both uh, uh, sort of mix. It is really uh, individual paced. Can you hear me now? No. Dr. Matiku? I'm not muted. You guys hear me? Yeah. Try and speak a little louder. Thank you. Okay. Can you let me? So that's better. Yes, you can hear me, right? So patients who uh, you know 
majority of the patients who may have a symptoms, as uh, Dr. Banker and Dr. Panuric alluded, is based on the utilization of the atrial contraction. Some patients may have adapted to this atrial fibrillation. May, they may ignore the symptoms of AFib at the beginning. So the, the living in atrial fibrillation may be the new normal for them. So they don't even know that the onset of AFib, by the time they present, the AFib may have progressed. There might be rapid heart rate or slow heart rate. And so those patients may not feel the symptoms. Yeah, I you, think, go ahead. But if you really ask questions, uh, very, if you take, take a thorough exam, there's always subtle symptoms that all patients feel. Uh, they just adapt to the new normal. So they don't really realize that they have had atrial fibrillation for quite some time. And of course, it's driven by the irregularity between upper and lower. Levels. Yeah, I, I've been surprised through the years of variety of people that have shown up to the office and get an EKG in there, an atrial fib, even with poor heart rate control. They have no idea. Going to the gym, playing tennis, jogging, et cetera. And so there's you know, a bell curve in terms of no symptomatology whatsoever. And I can't live life over on this side and kind of everything in between. Um, and then it kind of leads me to the notion of another bell curve, which is, these people can have really serious heart disease, and these people have no discernible heart disease. Um, Michael, would you like to address that notion in terms of the range of the arena, in terms of the people that present with atrial fib who are free of structural heart disease and they have good strong heart function versus people that are sicker or their heart diseases are worse or their heart function is worse? And how does that affect them with the atrial fibrillation? Um, so, yeah, if you have other structural heart disease, you're at risk for AFib, and as a result, so if you have heart failure, uh, the left atrium gets stretched, you have higher left atrial pressures, and that plays a role in triggering atrial fibrillation, um, whereas people who don't have any structural heart disease, um, they have some underlying predisposition to get atrial fibrillation that we don't quite understand. I'm sure there's some genetics to it. Sometimes we see it run in families, sometimes we don't. Um, but if you have the, just what we call lone AFib, um, that's actually a good thing because um, there's not other structural heart disease that's complicating the, the picture. What um, do you think triggers atrial fib in people with, quote, lone atrial fibrillation or without the presence of structural heart disease? What are some of the things that may trigger that? What do you mean trigger? Do you mean like lifestyle? Like causative, or? Yeah, causative or related factors that may predispose yeah, people so, to atrial fibrillation. So fit. things that increase your risk of atrial fibrillation are hypertension. Uh, if you uh, drink a lot of alcohol, have a lot of caffeine, um, a sedentary lifestyle, uh, all those things do increase your risk for atrial fibrillation. Uh, if you get down to more medically how it starts, um, and, and this will, this is how we target things for ablations. You do have four veins in the left side of the heart called the pulmonary veins. Mm -hmm. There's areas inside those veins that fire very rapidly and tend to be the trigger um, for atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. And all those things that we talked about, so for example, like alcohol or caffeine, those are stimulants to the heart. And when you have those, you're more likely for those areas inside the pulmonary veins to kind of fire and trigger atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Banker, um, what about people that, find out that they get atrial fibrillation when they're being active and with exercise and they trigger atrial fib and other people who tell you that they wake up with it in the middle of the night during sleep with it, or they wake up with it in the morning and they're in it. Is there a difference to that? How would you explain that? Well, it really depends on their underlying causes sometimes, especially when I hear that they wake up and they're in it. I worry that they actually have sleep apnea, which is another main cause of atrial fibrillation that we see commonly. However, when people are active and they go into it, typically that's because they have a, what we call a sympathetic trigger, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, uh, when, they're, when they're revved up, when their body's revved up, they're gonna actually irritate the cells that cause AFib and they go into it, right? And uh, for either one of those classifications, it, 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 in some ways it doesn't matter because the end result is atrial fibrillation and we have to see if they're symptomatic, we treat it. But sometimes knowing what 
causes it, number one, that gives the patient some empowerment, right? They can avoid these things, but if mm-hmm. other things that the patient wants to do, like go to work out, sometimes we need to, uh, you know, suppress the actual cells from firing in the first place, maybe with some medications to allow them to have their normal activities that they enjoy. Right. So, so any of you answer this, um, you just alluded to the sympathetic nervous system and activity or exercise or emotion and things like that. But what about the sleep factor? And I'll kind of throw it a kind of a point, maybe more from my era is that I, we used to see people that would trigger atrial fib during sleep. And the opposite to the sympathetic nervous system is the parasympathetic nervous system and the release of vagal nerve stimulation. And when you're in the deeper stages of sleep, you can augment further vagal mediation, which can cause an environment in the atrial electrical system that can trigger atrial fibrillation. Why I bring that up is because back when I was training before ablation and defibs and all that, the pharmacology was, and before many of the new drugs, most people were treated with digoxin and quinidine and maybe a beta blocker. And then procainamide came out. Well, we found that many of the people that were being given digoxin, which also augments vagus nervous system tone, their atrial fib continued to putter along. And when we would stop the digoxin, um, their atrial fibrillation would often get better with the help of a beta blocker with a drug like quinidine, which we don't use anymore. Um, And the, the, the interesting thing was when we, when we kind of drilled down with the patients during their history, they would always comment that they would awaken in the middle of the night with atrial fibrillation. So yes, sleep apnea is important, but um, we found that the vagus nerve stimulation may be an important factor too. Anybody want to comment on that or anything further? Uh, Just to follow up. Yeah, I, I would agree that vaguely derived AF is definitely a huge issue, especially we see it, especially in these younger males too, very commonly um, with vaguely derived AF. And there are certain medications we use nowadays in the modern era, reflecanide for vaguely derived AF is more of a classic agent. Um, but we see, and absolutely correct, at nighttime, and, and there's some talk about why sleep apnea would cause AFib, maybe mm-hmm. a little vagal mediation, right? Um, so it, it's, it's not necessarily... Um, when you hear that at nighttime, it still would make you think about sleep apnea, but absolutely that vagal mediation we see all the time. And there's other vagal triggers we see people have too, um, that certainly can cause it as well. It may be sometimes even as drinking a cold drink, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. That can cause it. An upset stomach. Mechanism. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Right. So uh, again, knowing these triggers can empower the patient and us as to what therapy we can give to the patient and also may mo- modify our treatment algorithms for an ablation side of things. If sure. You to go sure. To yeah, so uh, I'm not ready to talk about treatments yet. So I have a question for Dr. Matiku. Can you live a good life with atrial fibrillation? can of course um, uh, but you have to get a treatment to make sure that you modify because having a fib is a bad news let's 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 uh let's put it right having a fib is a bad news but it's a treatable condition atrial fibrillation is a treatable condition in certain times in certain scenarios potentially curable condition a uh, majority of the time we don't call a fib treatment as a cure whether it's ablation or medication but certain scenarios we near, we get close to a cure. So you could definitely have a quality of life close to as normal as possible. But that needs to be, uh, you know, has to be catered to each individual patient and whether that is stroke prevention, make sure we preserve heart function, you know, and also improve the quality of life. So if we do target all those areas, we can actually, somebody can actually live full quality of life and live with an atrium. When um, we're going to get into treatment coming up now, but I want to let you all, the three of my colleagues know, um, Dr. Matiku mentioned the possibility of cure. There's not much in the world of medicine that we can cure. Um, Surgeons can cure because they can remove a diseased gallbladder or remove a tumor or they can fix a malformation of an AV malformation or fix a broken bone. 
they can cure all that. In medicine, we usually have to manage illnesses and diseases with usually medications. But the ablation procedure really changed that, you know, both in my era, when we were doing more point specific ablations from a focal point with a ventricular tack or an atrial tack or an AV nodal reentry or one of those types of arrhythmias, very, very, very high rates of cure. And the ablation procedure has enabled these three men to cure a lot of people who have had atrial fibrillation without recurrence. We'll discuss the percentages later and we'll discuss the pitfalls later, but I do want to, um, um, you know, give that kudo to, to all of us for kind of opening up that world. There are a number of questions coming in on the corner here, by the way, um, about from the audience. And I, we're going to entertain questions, but I'm going to get to those questions a little bit later. Um, um, now, before we get into treatment strategies, the big treatment strategy has to do about all this fuss about stroke risk. And, um, and you hear a lot of advertisements on television with various medication commercials and cardiac app commercials about this huge incidence and risk of stroke with atrial fibrillation. And I often ask my patients when they come, like, what do you think your stroke risk is? And people who have said, you know, gosh, I'm going to have a stroke. I have atrial fibrillation. I'm going to, it's like 100%. It's 80%. It's 90%. So, um, Dr. Panudich, would you tell us about something that we've heard of, or maybe the public has heard of, something called a CHADS thing? Something about a CHADS thing that sure. identifies risk of stroke and what does that mean to our patients out there listening? And what do they have to take in order to prevent the risk of stroke, if anything? Yeah, and, and just a little comment. I, I would be very cautious with the term cure when it comes to atrial fibrillation. Because even though we do an ablation, someone may not have AFib for five years, it can always come back. We all have patients that we did an ablation and eight years later it starts coming back. So mm -hmm. I'm very hesitant to use the word yeah. cure for atrial fibrillation. It's a changing environment, right? Yeah, um, you know, other arrhythmias like atrial flutter and SVT, we can cure. Mm -hmm. um, but for AFib, I, I'm very cautious about that. So um, as many of you guys know, for stroke risk, AFib increases your risk of stroke by about five times normal. Um, it causes about one in seven every stroke of all strokes that happen uh, in the United States. Um, and so for people who have atrial fibrillation, um, what can happen is you have an outpouching of the heart called the appendage. It's like an appendix type of structure in your heart. And when you go into atrial fibrillation, it does not squeeze all the way. And so blood can get stagnant in that uh, appendage and form a clot. And that clot can break off and cause a stroke. And because it's a bigger uh, um, structure, uh, the clots tend to be bigger and the strokes from AFib tend to be bigger than other strokes. Um, so you are, you're not only at risk for a stroke, but a, a big stroke. So that's why we recommend anticoagulations and blood thinners um, to prevent that, uh, those clots from forming. Um, but not everybody needs the same blood thinner. So that's where our that Chad's VAST score comes in. It's a scoring system we use that attributes uh, points to every risk factor you have for a stroke. Um, what are those? It can, be, uh, it can be if you have heart failure, age, your sex, if you have vascular disease, if you have diabetes, um, if you had a heart attack or coronary disease. Um, so all those things get, get looked at and you get a score. And if your score is a zero, meaning you have none of them, you, you really don't need any anticoagulation. What is the risk of a stroke with a score of zero? Uh, less than 1%. Uh-huh. Yeah. And what is the maximum score that you can get? Uh, what is it? Nine. I think it is. And, and what's the risk of stroke with a score of nine? It's about, I think it's about 7% per year along those lines. Do you agree? Maybe right around there, maybe it'll touch higher. Yeah, uh -huh. so it doesn't go much higher than there. Um, and uh, I completely agree that if you, you, your score is zero or one, you can consider just not being on anything. But above that, I think the most important cornerstone of all this of uh, AFib therapy is anticoagulation. Yeah. So, you know, there's been this fair new information that the New York Times and CNN released. I don't think the, the paper was out yet about the dangers of aspirin, right? Mm 
So when do you decide to advise nothing? When do you advise to use an aspirin pill? And then when would you decide to use an anticoagulant? And, 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 and maybe uh, Dr. Matiku, you could explain to the audience what an anticoagulant is. Um, so anticoagulants are medications that we use to thin the blood. Um, and those medications work through uh, binding some of the circulating uh, blood products that would make somebody's blood thinner. So that way the platelets would not clump and form a clot. Um, going back to the aspirin question, I think you asked the question about aspirin, when would you give somebody an aspirin? When would you not give somebody an aspirin? As, as Dr. Banker mentioned, I think if your risk a chart VAS score is zero or one, uh, it, you probably don't need to give them, uh, usually you don't, we don't recommend anticoagulation, including aspirin unless those individuals have prior history of stroke from something else. Let's say some, they have a coronary artery disease and they have a stent or they need an aspirin for other purposes. So in those individuals, you could use an aspirin. Uh, let's say somebody, let's give you an example of a patient who is, let's say the 50 years old male, no other risk factors other than coronary artery disease and has a stent put in artery. So that individual may need to take an aspirin for the coronary disease. And the chart vascular is one because from coronary disease that they have. So mm -hmm. in that kind of individual, you can use an aspirin, even though that person is low risk on a, using chart vascular alone. So the original anticoagulant was something called warfarin or Coumadin, and we'd had to get people to get blood tests frequently, and they had to watch what they eat and how to interact with other medications. And in the last 10 years, we've had a few new drugs come out called novel anticoagulants. And can you talk to that a bit, Raj, in terms of which drugs do you have a preference to use? Sure. Um, just to, what, one, just to circle back real quick, but we do not use aspirin anymore for, for AFib. Just, just want to be clear, because I think a lot of people are still on there with a low CHADS VASC score of zero one and have, an, have already been given aspirin. So mm -hmm. a lot of our audience may actually be part of that group. Um, and it's something to consider going off of that aspirin. Uh, the European guidelines were updated many years ago and then our guidelines are coming online too since 2019, um, talking about not using aspirin in that category. But when we talk about high CHADS VASC scores, meaning two or above, where we would want to give an anticoagulant, we have our choices between warfarin, which is the older school anticoagulant that has to be managed with uh, weekly or biweekly or monthly INR checks or blood checks to see what the levels are, uh, accompanied by some dietary restrictions. We've moved on now to a new class of medications called novel anticoagulants, and that includes multiple drugs. You've all seen the commercials on Eloquis, Zeralto, Bradaxa, Cevesa. There's a host of medications now that are uh, utilized in this setting. And they, they can be very helpful in increasing the stroke rate reduction in addition to being easier to take. And now it's about a 14% risk reduction of stroke with the new classes of medications compared to warfarin. So there's a definite benefit beyond just the fact that you don't have to change, check your blood every few weeks. So it's both convenient and it is more efficacious. So it's definitely a push for us to get people to change over from warfarin over to these new medications that can be treated. Of them, I do prefer Eloquist just because it has the better stroke, I'm sorry, better uh, tolerance side effect profile compared to the other agents, but they're all pretty good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Panudic, um, when do you decide to work with people in their management of atrial fibrillation and that they can live life with atrial fibrillation and stay in atrial fibrillation. And how would you manage that situation versus trying to get them back into normal heart rhythm? Uh, there are various strategies and perhaps you could open the door to our audience about the concept of these two different strategies and what they are and how they are approached. Right. So, you know, atrial fibrillation, you, usually you can really live uh, just as long as you would live uh, not in atrial fibrillation, um, as long as your heart rate's controlled and, and you're actually on a blood thinner. Um, 
And in some patients, especially that are older, um, if you're not having any symptoms from your AFib, you can live a perfectly good life, just controlling your heart rate and staying on a blood thinner. Uh, I actually have a couple patients that are in their seventies and they're literally running half marathons and they're in AFib all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've been in AFib for a long time, uh, especially if you're older and you've been in AFib a long time, um, it, it's, it's much more difficult to get you back into rhythm and keep you in rhythm. And so then you have to look at what benefits you're getting out of going through medications and procedures if you're not going to feel better and, and not necessarily going to live longer. Um, now, that even though people don't have symptoms, you can still have some benefit to staying in rhythm. So if your heart function's gotten a little weak, um, then by putting you back into science rhythm, it can actually improve um, despite you not having symptoms. So there are times that even though people are not having symptoms, we will try a rhythm, what we call a rhythm control strategy and put people back into rhythm. For people who have symptoms from their AFib, then we definitely want to try to get them into, into rhythm. And, and then we, we want to make them feel better. We want them to have a better quality of life. Thank you. So let me extend that question to Dr. Matiku now in terms of a, the rate control side of it and the rhythm control side of it. And what I talk to patients about if we're trying to seek the rhythm control side of it, trying to live life with normal heart rhythm, not having atrial fibrillation, how do we as cardiologists and arrhythmia specialists go about doing that? And um, so we've got this category of medications that we use uh, that are kind of designed around that. What's their level of success and failure and tolerance? And then, of course, that's going to open the door to the new world that you guys have played such a special role in of um, atrial fibrillation ablation procedures. When do you decide to go in one direction versus another? When I get a uh, consult on a patient's comes and sees me for atrial fibrillation, uh, whether that's a rhythm management or rate management, the primary emphasis is to go after what caused the disease. You have to treat the disease upstream. Can you hear me? I, I think your voice just came a little louder. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think maybe it's the setup here. Uh, let me see. That sounds a little better. Um, just being maybe, I should lean, maybe I should lean forward to the computer. Right? That sounds better. Yeah, I think it's a setup here. Yeah. So the, when I see a patient with an atrial fibrillation, my primary goal is treat the disease upstream. What caused the atrial fibrillation? Are their blood pressure control? Do they have a coronary disease? Is coronary disease has been addressed appropriately? If they have a sleep apnea, is the sleep apnea has been evaluated and treated? And once you exhaust all, and of course also, the patient is drinking or have a substance issues, they have to subtract all those things. Once you optimize those conditions, then, uh, then you can add medication to help you manage the atrial fibrillation, whether you're gonna go uh, medication that will control their rate or, uh, or antiarrhythmics. Just talking about a little bit about antiarrhythmics, there are roughly about five antiarrhythmics available to us at this point in the market that we can use. Uh, they come with a different profile of side effects uh, and different patients tolerate different uh, medications. So we have to cater to each individual patient, it depends on their health, medical health. So patients who have a certain type of condition, you cannot use those medications. Some of those medications are clear by the liver, some of the medications are clear by the kidney. So we have to cater for each individual patients. The majority of the medications if you give them for antiarrhythmic use, roughly the efficacy is 50% successful, mm -hmm. roughly 50%. If you're in the 50% group that's successful, it's very successful. Yes, exactly. And if you're in the 50% yeah. exactly. Yeah. And there's one medication that is actually very good, a strong medication that we use it as a bridge to something, but it has a lot of side effects. And it's called yeah. amiodarone. It's a great medication, it's our best armament. And it's a medication that we can use to, to bridge our patients, whether they, they need to get, get from a arrhythmia to sinus rhythm, uh, whether we need to use a bridge to ablation. Those medica that medication seems to be the best. But unfortunately, that medication has a, a lot of side effects that you cannot use them as, as a chronic use. Thank you. Anybody want to add to that? 
Is there somebody out there that you would not treat? Yes. Patient who has that, who has an address, all the, let's say somebody's drinking, heavy drinking, that's maybe the contributor to the AFM. I would like to help that individual. And the best way to do it is subtract the drinking because that's a constant stimulant, that's constant insult to the heart. Um, of course, I'm, I would treat that individual. Part of the treatment is counseling, counseling cessation, alcohol cessation, or substance if they're using any stimulant to subtract those. Uh, that's one category of individuals that I might be preserved from applying stronger medication, trying to restore the rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also patients, scenarios where the treatment is worse than the disease. What, let's say somebody, show, if somebody has a very advanced heart disease, let's say have a congestive heart failure, they have a, a multitude of issues that makes their success of keeping them in normal rhythm very difficult. Those individuals, by giving them more medication, trying to restore the rhythm, maybe more harmful than the leaving them in AFib and make sure that they anticoagulated and prevent from them having a stroke, also treat their heart rate so that way they will be more heart rate is managed so they won't fall into heart failure or any consequence of AFib. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was gonna to start to open the door now for ablation um, world, but there, there's a series of questions here on the right side of my screen. Many of them are centered around ablation, but here's a question that I thought I'd throw out to the three of you. Um, given the contemporary issues of what we're dealing with in society, any relationship between COVID and atrial fib? Can COVID trigger atrial fib? Anybody want to have an answer to that? Yes. Sure. Um, so everything that we'll, probably all of us will say here is going to be more anecdotal based on our experience based instead of actual data, because I don't think we've had enough time now to have the data out there uh, in a published format or a peer reviewed format. But I will say that I have noticed a definitive uh, correlation between both the COVID disease pathology and arr arrhythmogenesis, and not just in the atrium. Um, but definitely atrial fibrillation be, being more exacerbated by COVID. Um, and uh, some new instances of atrial fibrillation have popped up afterwards, whether that's just unmasking of a, of a problem due to a severe illness, yeah. or otherwise I cannot say. In addition, we've also seen a relationship between COVID vaccine and, um, and reactions thereof, meaning the normal immunogenic response um, uh, oftentimes exacerbating their atrial fibrillation if it's a pre-existing disease, not so much new in creation, but exacerbating their atrial fibrillation for a period of a couple of weeks afterwards too. Yeah, maybe I could add two comments to that. Um, first, I see, I think you and I may see different patient populations, you know, given that you're my ablator for, you know, the, all three of you, you see more atrial fib that need help more uh, than I do. But I've seen a lot of people in the last year post COVID and even some post COVID vaccine, I haven't seen any atrial fibrillators per se, but I'm seeing a lot of people with palpitation and uh, you know, sinus tachycardia, fast heart rates folks out there that is normal heart rhythm, but faster than that should be. And it takes months sometimes for it to start settling down. And I think we've all known that like flu-like illnesses and the post-viral syndrome situations that many influenzas present through the years have you know, several months where there may be a series of symptoms and signs that persist and malinger that gradually settle down. I would also add that atrial fib shows up more frequently with pulmonary illnesses, you know, from pneumonias and flus in general, uh, you know, of which COVID is its own unique variety. So I wouldn't be surprised that we're seeing more atrial fib in these types of patients because their lungs are more involved. Um, so, uh, Michael, anything to add on that? No, I, I, I think I agree with what Raj said. I, I actually, both of you, I, I, I haven't seen a ton of AFib or patients coming in with new AFib right after COVID. That being said, in the hospital today, I saw two patients with COVID who have new onset AFib. And whether that's the COVID per se or just the, infl the inflammatory response to what's going on, like Raj says, like, we don't know that at this point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So um, who can I ask to open the door to the ablation procedure? When, when do we start proceeding with patients for an ablation? Is anybody walking through your front door? Are they a candidate for an ablation? I, I've certainly met electrophysiologists who are willing to do them very quickly on people. Others are a little bit more circumspect and have we tried this or have we tried that? Um, Raj, I'm gonna ask you to take that question first and then we, we may proceed you know, with the other, Dr. Panudic and Dr. Matiku to add to that as well. I think that's a big question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, there again, selection bias that I think some of us in the panel here may have is that people who are sent to us are oftentimes being sent for ablation consideration, right? But if we take yeah. the average patient who walks through the door with atrial fibrillation, um, certainly ablation should not be the first thing that's talked about, right? We need to, to make sure that there's not concomitant illness. Is AFib seen secondary to something else? And we need to evaluate the patient for underlying disease, and that can involve echocardiograms, et cetera, right? That we have to look for under other things in that patient. But after we've gone down that path and we're assuming that this patient is, you know, uh, symptomatic in their atrial fibrillation, and um, they're looking to restore sinus rhythm, then we can consider the modalities for bringing them back to that. And we then have to consider either medications to get them down that path, which can be antiarrhythmic drugs that we've all alluded to in this conversation versus ablation. And um, nowadays ablation is talked about as a potential first line therapy before talking about those antiarrhythmic drugs. But um, classically, uh, we've always talked about having them fail at least one of those drugs before we walk down the ablation path. Now, um, times they are changing, right? So we have multiple trials, actually six trials now that have looked at using ablation as, as a first line therapy and guidelines, they are changing as well. So um, either way, if we're looking to go down the treatment path of ablation, we have to evaluate them for candidacy. And candidacy for ablation really looks at how, what is your success rate gonna be? And what are your risks in doing the actual procedure? Some patients, um, you know, uh, as, as much as you'd like to offer them this therapy for ablation, they um, have lifestyle considerations like severe obesity or underlying problems as Dr. Matika re referenced, like say alcohol abuse or whatever, that may make it so that success rates from the ablation would be quite poor. Also structural heart problems or pre-existing pulmonary disease may turn us off from the concept from a poor success. Uh, perspective. And from the risks perspective, we also have to look at, you know, um, well, is this patient, I hate to say it, but too old? Is this patient have other comorbidities that are going to uh, make it a more risky uh, procedure? In those patients, again, we would probably turn away from that uh, concept. So it really is a, it's a multimodality approach to whether or not we go down the pathway of ablation. Oftentimes medications by themselves are the better option, but if ablation is a valid, um, you know, path forward, it can be quite effective. Do you have anything to add to that, uh, Dr. Panudic? Yeah, I mean, the other thing is just kind of, there's, there's a patient input to this as well too. So, for people that are candidates for ablation, I mean, I have one end of the spectrum. We have people that are like, listen, you're not touching me with a 10 foot pole. You can, you know, I'll do medications and yoga and, and acupuncture and all this stuff to not have AFib. And then there's the other end of the spectrum that's like, listen, poke me, prod me, do whatever you have to do. I want this gone. Don't even talk to me on medications. So, you know, how comfortable you are with procedures, how comfortable you are with medications. Um, how okay you are with taking medications, all of that's going to play into your decision uh, to go forward with an ablation versus medical therapy. And that's a discussion you just have to have with your, with your physician. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I'm one of the cardiologists out there with the special arrhythmia training and electrophysiology experience. And you're the guys I send my patients to for ablation procedures. And I've had people that are, they're usually male, you know, they're usually in the younger age ranges in the 40s and 50s, and they do not want to be on a medication and they want this fixed right now. 
And then other people, as you say, I will not do that. And, you know, and I'll go on this drug or that drug, whatever. And uh, I just don't want to even open that door if I don't have to. It's very much about taking care of one patient at a time. Um, I'll, I'll make a brief comment about the study that, um, that was presented a few years ago at Heart Rhythm Society, which was called the Arrest AF trial from Australia. Um, and it was a group of uh, doctors and nurses who approached the people waiting in line for their ablation. <laughs> and of all the people that were waiting in line, they approached them about lifestyle changes, if you remember that study. And, you know, the usual things that we're talking about tonight, you know, cut back on your drinking, treat your sleep apnea, lose weight, exercise, um, stop drinking, etc. Treat better care of your diabetes, all the things that are interplaying with the development of atrial fib. So the, all the people got the usual advice and then a few people volunteered to be selected to enter a program where they worked very diligently on a weekly basis with trainers, nurses, and doctors and got into nutrition programs. Their sleep apnea issues were perfected. They stopped drinking. They were coached and stopped smoking. They got into good exercise condition, et cetera. And up to 80% of them had resolution of their atrial fibrillation with no need to proceed with ablation. So it's hard work to do that. And most people aren't willing to take on that effort. Um, but as we've already been talking about, it's definitely um, an option in terms of your overall care as a human being and having good health. Um, Dr. Matiku, would you like to describe briefly to the audience what an ablation is and what how it works? There is a question here from somebody who has some um, background, I presume, PVS ablation being the cornerstone of AFib, does that mean there are always going to be abnormal cells coming from them triggering an episode? If none are present, do they still ablate them and why? Um, but nonetheless, um, why don't you walk the audience through what you do in the EP lab with an ablation? Yeah, so atrial fibrillation, as we uh, understand it, majority of atrial fibrillation is a disease of the left upper chamber of the heart. It's called left atrium. And where are the veins drain blood from the lungs back to the heart, through the pulmonary veins, the interface between the veins to the heart, there are a lot of nerves innervation, a lot of nerves that get irritated or maladapt as the person having AFib. So if you take all the comers, somewhere between 80 to 90% of their triggers early in the disease process of atrial fibrillation, the triggers originate from the pulmonary veins. So therefore, categorically, everybody that comes in for atrial fibrillation would get what we call pulmonary vein isolation. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you, you get a pulmonary vein isolation. So to do that, we normally get a put a long IV axis from the right groin and thread the wire inside the heart and we cross from the right side to the left side of the heart. There's a thin membrane that we all were born with. We use a, a fine needles to cross from the right side to the left side. And once we get to the left side, majority of people have four different veins, distinct veins that drains left upper, left lower, left right upper, right lower lung to the, right at, uh, to the left atrium. So we target those veins and electrically isolate, means cauterize or freeze those nerves that cause an AFib in those individuals. So once we do that, we look for other sources or other triggers that would cause an atrial fibrillation. Um, Can I interject? Can I interject? Yeah. So basically you're kind of creating a line, line around the veins that are sealing off the triggerings inside the pulmonary vein. Is that correct? Entering the heart, yes. Yeah. yeah. And what is the end point? The, the, so the end point is getting the, the, make sure there is no electrical impulse originating in the vein entering the heart and the electrical originating from the heart not entering into the vein. So we check both block in each direction. Uh -huh. And at that point, we look for other triggers. We give a patient stimulants like a very couple medication that we can give the patient to check those lines are actually blocked. And that is the first line of an ablation. We call it pulmonary vein isolation, PVI. That's what that stands for. I think the person is mixing up uh, PVS uh, in 
they are meant to say TVI, which is the pulmonary vein isolation. Mm -hmm. We're electrically isolating the veins from the left atrium. That's the cornerstone of atrial fibrillation ablation. Dr. Banker, how well does it work? Uh, it depends on the modality used, depends on the error that we're talking about. And, um, uh, you know, with regards to success rate overall, all from the procedure, if that's your question, or is mm -hmm. it how mm -hmm. well does pulmonary vein isolation uh, persist? Uh, so success rate from the procedure can vary. It really depends on the patient, right? So if the patient's in AFib all the time, they're going to have a lower success rate than a patient who has a smaller burden of AFib, meaning AFib that's coming and going. If, they, if, if the uh, patient has structural heart disease, like a large left atrium, things like that, that's also going to weigh in a negative fashion on the outcome of the ablation. Can I interrupt you for just a sec? Sure. Uh, we haven't really addressed that. You mentioned somebody who's in atrial fib all the time versus somebody who's in and out of it. So what does that mean? So uh, when we look at atrial fibrillation, it's a spectrum. Um, when it starts, you're oftentimes just going to have one short little episode that you'll likely ignore. And um, over time, episodes typically come more frequently and they last longer. Uh, that spectrum eventually ends where atrial fibrillation comes one day and it just doesn't go away. So in the beginning, before that happens, we call that paroxysmal or coming and going atrial fibrillation. After it's there all the time, we call that chronic or possibly persistent atrial fibrillation. Right. Um, so that's the difference in terminology between the two. So in where does the electrical shock come into play? So electrical shock typically is useful as a one time fix. Right. So if you have atrial fibrillation, it's usually caused. I think everybody else has alluded to the fact that there's something wrong in your heart that's firing off and causing atrial fibrillation. So if you were to go into an episode where it does not come out either after a period of time, you may seek what we call a cardioversion, which is where we apply current to the heart. You see this fancy on TV when they go clear and they shock your heart. It's something we call a cardioversion, right? Um, where we can do that in a very controlled, safe, easy fashion in, in, um, in a lab. And we are able to shock your heart back to normal rhythm times one. So we get everything to quiet down times one. It doesn't keep that guy from firing again later on. And so we may need to use medications to quiet that guy down or potentially ablation. So there are more people that are more ideally suited for an ablation procedure versus people who are less suitable for it? Absolutely. So uh, we use the analogy oftentimes I will with patients that uh, think of it like, uh, think that we're gardeners and, and your AFib is a tree and you want us to cut down that tree. It's a lot easier to do it when the thing's a sapling and just growing out of the ground. I can grab that and toss it away. But if it's a mighty oak, there's a much larger chance that I'm going to go up, try to cut down that tree and miss something, right? So it's mm -hmm. an awful lot easier to attack this disease process earlier in the disease pathology than later. Dr. Panudic, I have a tough question for you. What, how would you address success rates for atrial fib? What is the percentage of people that you're successful with and they don't have recurrence? Um, how many people that may have a recurrence and you decide to take back to the lab for maybe finishing things up a little bit more so the second time? When would you stop doing ablations on somebody? Is there a point? And we're then going to get into what's the downside of ablation? What are the problems with ablation? What are the complications? I don't know how much of that you want to take on, but why don't you start off with the success He's rate. asking to do an hour-long uh, yeah. presentation on ablation. Um, so in general, we, we quote, again, it depends on what type of AFib you have, like Dr. Banker outlined. So for people of paroxysmal AFib, that you're going in and out of AFib, and you have a normal left atrial size where we're working. Um, we usually quote success rates at about 80%. And that makes, and, and that doesn't mean it's 80% of the job we do is good. Um, most of the time we go in and you get those, you get the pulmonary veins isolated. People still have AFib, but it's because it's not coming from the pulmonary vein. It's coming from somewhere else. And I can tell you that, you know, when I go back in to do an ablation, I'm, I'm sure the other doctors too, is 99% of the time, the ablation I did the first time is perfect. You know, there's not, everything I ablated is, is still ablated, um, but now you have to start thinking of, of tackling something else. Now, as you progress down the spectrum that Dr. Banker mentioned, the success rates start to drop. 
So when you start having longer episodes, especially if you become what we call persistent atrial fibrillation when you're in it all the time, uh, your success rates drop significantly. Uh, if you are one of those people that is in what we call persistent AFib and your left atrium is enlarged, you're looking at like a 55% success rate from a standard pulmonary vein isolation procedure. Um, and now once your pulmonary veins are isolated, we do have um, options of trying to target things outside of the pulmonary veins uh, for ablation. Uh, the, some things have panned out, some things have not, some things are kind of in the works. Um, and we're always kind of striving to look for new things that we can ablate to successfully keep people in normal rhythm. Um, but I think, you know, as so overall, I think if you're a paroxysmal patient, you can expect a, uh, an outcome of, of hopefully about 80% of not having a significant amount of AFib. If you're more of a persistent AFib patient, you're, you're looking more of a 55 to 60%. Um, so now what was, uh, I can't remember the rest of your, well, then it gets to the downside. Um, oh. what's the oh. bad stuff that can happen with an atrial fibrillation ablation? Uh, you know, we always talk about a risk for something that could have a terrible or a tragic outcome and the risk might be one in a thousand or one in 10,000, but when you're that person, it's 100% bad, right? Um, it's what are the very, really bad things that? that can happen with ablation? So Ferry, do you have something you want to yes. say before we so, move on to that? I'm going back to the, the success rate, right? The, yeah. The success rate, I think, I think that's one of the things that sort of misunderstood by the, the patients and the communities. The success rate of if your goal is to, again, going back to the issue of cure, right? There's no such a thing cure in the atrial fibrillation. I think we all accept that. We all understand that. We all agree on that. But so therefore, if somebody coming to you because they want to be cured of this condition, then your success rate is almost zero because you're not going to get that 100% AFib free. But if you set the goals of ablation, if your intent is to give the quality of life and reduce the AFib frequencies and the burden of the atrial fibrillation, then of course we can do significant amount of AFib reduction. Let's say somebody's arbitrarily 20%. 20% of the time they're in atrial fibrillation. Then if you do an ablation, you can get them to one digit, maybe even lower than that. And you could have them in a remission for years with a durable result that may or may not require one or two procedures. So the success has to be really carefully defined because each individual patients have a different notion of, they think, or some of them do, think that once you do an ablation, it's good. That means they, they're cured of the disease even though we call it success rate of 70, 80, whatever percent we quote them, that is for durable results, not necessarily a cure of the disease. For the next five years, the chance of you being a 53 is 75% chance, not necessarily for life. So that has to be really defined and has to be approached in the context because most of the time patients have this understanding that we really go in there and cure them. And, and that would be great. I, I wish we could do that. But reality. That, that's actually, that's, that's a really good point, actually, because the success rates I, I quoted are based on studies that follow people for one year after the ablation, mm -hmm. and who's had recurrence of the AFib within that one year. And that, that's just because that's how long it's, it's feasible to kind of follow a large patient population. Which is how the um, medications are looked at, too. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but for example, so if you're someone that has AFib, every other day for five hours and it's debilitating to you. And then you do an ablation and you have AFib, you know, one episode every six months that lasts about 10 minutes. Technically you're a failure in the studies, but if, but for that patient, that's a success. How many people do we see in the other arenas of cardiology that get bypass surgery and stenting for their blocked coronary arteries and they think they are cured um, and they go on and continue to live their lifestyles and there's no cure for the underlying disease of atherosclerosis. Yeah, I think you have to look at AFib the same way. Yeah, uh, you it's know, very much a partnership really yeah, between yeah. you and me, the maybe the treating or the managing cardiologist and the patient because if the patient is going to continue to be overweight and eat bad food and drink too much and not treat their sleep apnea and so on and so forth, 
their likelihood of ongoing problems with atrial fibrillation remains. Yeah, I think I heard John Day say, make that analogy many years ago, and it really yes. stuck with me that it's you're it's you have to treat AFib very much like coronary disease. You're not getting rid of the underlying condition. You're yes. trying to manage it. And you know, when, when you put a stent in, you're trying to prevent angina. When you do the ablation, we're trying to prevent the symptoms from AFib. And it's very similar. Yeah. Here's a question that shows up, which uh, I'd like one of you to answer. What about pulsed field ablation, which is now done routinely in Bordeaux, France, since March of 2021? I can take that if you'd like. Um, Thank you. So, yeah. So, as you mentioned, originally an, an ablation, uh, we first started with DC current. And then we moved on from DC current to what we thought were better technologies with radio frequency, cryo, et cetera. And now we're potentially circling back to DC current because um, how we can apply it um, in different ways can result in a safer ablation for the patient. One of the, uh, the reasons that we're pursuing is something called pulse field ablation, which essentially is DC current, but in very short wavelengths and uh, durations of time is because we can selectively kill off um, cardiac tissue and not kill off surrounding tissues, which are the reason for why we have some of the risks during the procedure. Um, in the US, it's still in its infancy. Um, I, I've done several hundred procedures with the PFA, but uh, all on pigs. <laughs> so nothing in humans yet. Um, and we, we actually have several centers now that have come online with uh, a new technology called Ferropulse. That, um, Say that again, the word slurred. Ferropulse. Ferropulse is something, is, is a company, there's actually about 34 companies in this space trying to race for pulse field ablation coming forward. Um, but the uh, it's not really widely available in the United States right now. And it's also not um, in its final forms, meaning the products that you're going to see uh, out right now are first generation but it does have the promise of making ablation a more safer procedure in the future. Thank you, thank you, well done. Um, Dr. Panudic, here's a question from the audience. Is ablation and watchmen ever done together for older but active people? We don't usually do them at the same procedure. Um, part of that is a reimbursement um, issue. Um, the other issue is that the, um, with watching our transeptal or going across is in a little different position. Um, and explain, that, the, explain that to the audience, transept, what, what do you mean? Yeah, so when I say transeptal, if you remember, Dr. Um, Matiku mentioned that, well, we have to cross from the left side to the right side of the heart. So we're actually poking a hole through the septum, that thin area of the heart that separates the right and left side. So you do that with a, with a large needle. And when we do a watchman, you have to go in a very specific spot to get the angle right, to get the watchman device implanted um, versus, and that's totally different from the site that we're crossing with uh, um, AFib ablation. Um, and the, the official recommendation from the, even the company is to, to, to do the ablation first and get that all treated and then consider watchman subsequent to that. Mm -hmm. The other thing to be aware of is that once the watchman's in, um, it can, if you, if the, the site where the washing goes in, sometimes that we need to ablate that area for AFib. There's a, what we call a ridge there between the, so the pulmonary veins and the appendage. Um, that sometimes you need to ablate on the appendage side of the ridge to get a result that you want. Um, and once the washing is in and seals up, it's impossible to get to that site. So um, there are doctors out there doing them both. I don't know, they're not, they're just not really being reimbursed for both, or the hospital's not. Um, but generally, we do not do those together. Thank you. Um, so sometimes it just, oh, I was going to ask, I think I started off with you, Dr. Panudic, but anybody may wish to take on this unpleasant question. What are the real bad pitfalls? What, what are the worst things that can happen with an ablation procedure? Yeah, I think the, the overall risk of ablations, especially here are very low. And you're looking at 1%. Even if the national rate's a little higher, I think our, our complication rate's 1% or less um, between the three of us. Um, the, the, the big ones to, to kind of know is, is anytime we put catheters into the heart, there's a risk of us poking a hole through the wall of the heart. 
and that can cause blood to leak out around the heart. And if that happens, that can require us putting a drain in to drain it out. And if it doesn't stop bleeding, you may need open heart surgery. Um, anytime we put catheters on the left side of the heart, um, you can form clots on those catheters that can break off and cause a stroke. Um, we give a lot of blood thinners to prevent that from happening, um, but still you, uh, you're looking at a risk of about a one in a thousand uh, for that happening. So again, well less than 1%. And that's a national thing. I, I don't even know of any strokes that have happened at this hospital from doing any fibrillation. Um, the, you do have a nerve um, that uh, goes to the diaphragm on the right side of the heart called the phrenic nerve. Um, that runs right by the right side of pulmonary veins. And when we ablate, if that gets damaged, um, that can paralyze the dia diaphragm. Um, we worry about that a lot, not just with RF, but especially with cryo uh, balloon that we're doing. So we actually pace that nerve to watch the diaphragm move while we're ablating to make sure it does not get damaged. Uh, if it does, well over 90% of them recover, um, usually very quickly, but if, even if it's a persistent um, uh, paralysis of that nerve over the over the, the, the following year, they almost always recover. Uh, I think the most catastrophic um, uh, uh, complication of the procedure is what we call atrial esophageal fistula, which is extraordinarily rare. I mean, it's well less than 1%. And, and in some registries, it doesn't even exist. But um, when we, your esophagus, which is your food pipe, lies right behind the heart. So when we ablate on the back side of the heart, uh, if we damage the esophagus and damage it enough that you get a hole in the esophagus, you're looking at a death rate of about 60 to 70 percent. It usually happens about a week or so after the procedure. Um, but we monitor the temperatures within the esophagus so we can make sure it doesn't get too cold or too hot, um, which, is a, which is a big risk. Um, some of us give some prophylactic medications after the procedure. Um, but again, the, the, the chance of that happening is extraordinarily low. Thank you. Do, do either of you, Dr. Matuku and Dr. Banker, have anything to add to that? Um, it was well covered. It was well covered. Well covered. Let me just add the, the, another common thing to potentially think about, too, is bleeding at the site of access, mm -hmm. right? That's that's one, not one that we all, any of us quite worry about too much, because usually this is not a complication that requires much intervention other than watching or manual pressure, things like that. But that is a common thing we, uh, we also need to worry about, too, is that the groin access, making sure that there's no bleeding there. Thank you. We'll finish up soon. Um, so atrial fib can be readily managed. It can uh, provide people with a perfectly normal life in terms of how well it's well taken care of, both in terms of heart rate profile and dynamic range of heart rates versus maintenance of normal heart rhythm with medications and with ablation procedures, but there are always the unfortunate, you know, that just have one problem after another and they continue to have problems with heart rate and problems with recurrences or their heart rates are just too fast. So um, who would like to address the audience to an older procedure, which still has great uh, relevance and uh, can really kind of pull us, us out of the bucket uh, and help the patient quite a lot, which is, the application of a permanent pacemaker and not an atrial fibrillation ablation, but an AV nodal ablation. And, um, and who wants to take that on? And I would ask them to tell the audience the difference between the complexity of an atrial fib ablation and what an AV nodal ablation is and why do you need a pacemaker? And what does it do for you? Why is it a successful procedure? Go ahead. Sure. Um, I can take that on if you'd like. Um, so an AV nodal ablation, uh, essentially what we look at, right, is for patients who may not be a traditional candidate for an atrial fibrillation ablation procedure, meaning the more complex procedure that we've been alluding to for the last 15, 20 minutes here, um, but are still very symptomatic. Um, and uh, typically those symptoms are uh, originating in the fact that their heart rate is both fast and irregular. Okay. Um, for those patients, we initially tried to use medications because they're, they're not a traditional AFib ablation candidate. We'll try to use medications to try to slow that heart rate down, maybe control it. But sometimes the patient isn't able to tolerate those medications or the medications are ineffective. Right? At that point, we talk about, say, hey, how do we restore a measure of quality of life or lifestyle function to this patient uh, 
and or uh, let's not let the patient go too fast and, and run into problems with going too fast related heart problems, right? So uh, we look at another option, something called an AV nodal ablation with a pacemaker. What that means is we're, um, we're going to consider doing a mini ablation, not a, not a complex AFib ablation like we talked about, but a mini ablation where we go up with a catheter from the groin, same kind of access, but our target is much easier to ascertain. So our target is the connection point between the top chambers and the bottom chambers electrically. So as we know, the top chambers are the ones in the electrical storm, the AFib, they're going really fast. They're telling the bottom chambers to go faster and irregular. And if we can target the connection point between the top and the bottom, the bottom chambers can no longer listen to the AFib and go fast and irregular. That typically um, is very easy to accomplish with this mini ablation, right? And it tends to be a more durable result, meaning a long-term final result than the AFib ablation that we had spoken about again earlier. However, if we do that, that means the bottom chambers are getting no input whatsoever electrically, and they're not gonna really do anything unless we're able to give them a artificial way of beating. And that's with a pacemaker, right? A pacemaker is gonna provide that electrical input to the bottom chambers so that they can continue to beat on, right? And we can set those pacemakers to let the patient go faster with running or slower when they're just resting to simulate a norm, normal lifestyle. And, and after we do this procedure, oftentimes those patients who are very symptomatic or going too fast can lead a largely normal life afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody have anything else they'd like to talk about with atrial fibrillation? You take care of one patient at a time and we have a variety of options that we can help people live their lives better. The objective is to live life as well as you can. And some people, as we've already talked about, can live perfectly normal lives. There was a question here. Can one do exercise even if one is in atrial fibrillation? Is it okay? The objective on all of our parts, all four of us, is to treat people kindly, try to solve their problems, and sometimes teach them to live with their problems in a way that lives them the most normal life possible. Um, I, I have a cute anecdote, which I kind of get a kick out of, uh, which is I started practice here in about 1985, 86, and uh, it was well before the era of ablation. And I saw a man in about 70 years of age who had had chronic atrial fibrillation needed to be on warfarin at the time and a beta blocker to help with his heart rate control. And he'd seen three previous cardiologists. None of them were arrhythmia specialists like we are. And he'd had angiograms and multiple bad newses and don't do this and don't do that. And I told him and his daughter that he was otherwise a healthy guy. If you don't end up with other diseases, you'll probably make it to 90 without a problem. And uh, I don't think you guys were on staff yet, but it was when the uh, new building opened, you know, the new women's pavilion. And there was a reception for the hospital and many of the people in the community attended it and uh, wine and, you know, hors d'oeuvres and stuff like that. And uh, I was standing literally circled by five of my patients, all of who had atrial fibrillation. And we were chatting and, um, this person came and tapped on my shoulder and I turned, I said, are you Dr. Chesney? And I said, yes, I am. She said, well, we just toasted you the other day on the weekend when we had the family over for dinner. So I said, geez, that's really great, but why did you do that? Well, you saw my dad 20 years ago and he had atrial fibrillation and he was scared to death of it. And you told him to relax, take these medications and he'll probably make it to 90, live life well. And we just celebrated his 90th birthday, so we toasted you on that memory. So the bottom line is that you can live life very well with atrial fibrillation, perhaps with our help. But um, I'd like to thank Drs. Panudich and Dr. Banker and Dr. Matiku to take the time for this really enjoyable, I think it was really enjoyable, and I really enjoyed the input of everybody. Um, and wait a sec, here's, oh, one final one final question for Dr. Matiku before we close this down, okay? For someone 
that has had a successful ablation where AFib was ablated and there have been no occurrences of AFib for a few months, can that person go off blood thinners? I also have a loop recorder implanted for monitoring. Very uh, good question. Actually, that is not an uncommon question that we normally receive. Uh, so if we anticoagulate patients based on their chart bus score, go back into, uh, you remember earlier in the discussion, Dr. Panuric went and discussed about who do we uh, give a blood thinners? Patients who have a two or more chart bus score, they will end up requiring, because they're in high risk category for a stroke, those individuals end up needing a, um, a anticoagulation. Now, for this specific uh, question, it depends. One, what is the chart vascular of this individual? If their chart vascular is low, then they can potentially come off the blood thinner after three months post ablation. Not within the first three months, the majority of us practice because after ablation, the heart is inflamed. Uh, when the heart is inflamed from ablation itself, it can form a clot. And that clot can break off and cause a stroke. So we preferentially put patients at least minimum three months post ablation, uh, unless patients have a contraindication for uh, anticoagulation, which may be a different story. Uh, now, if charge bar score is borderline, let's say between, uh, let's say two, this is a much difficult uh, question to answer. Let's say anybody, we categorize them to be two or higher to be high risk, but all the chart vascos are not created equal. Let's say, let's take a 65 years old woman. That individual has a two risk factor for thromboembolism, one of them being gen female gender, two for age. Those are not equivalent with somebody who has a diabetes and a congestive heart failure. That is not equivalent to somebody who has a prior stroke and hypertension. So we have to customize for each individual patient. So I don't want to categorically say, we, yes, you can come off the anticoagulation or not. It has to be customized with each individual patient. So if you're in a borderline, somebody chart vascular one and two, there might be a discussion with your electrophysiologist where you can come off the anticoagulation if you can monitor your arrhythmia and you are on a tet your chart vascular is not one that we consider very high risk, for example, heart failure or prior stroke, then you might be able to come up with anticoagulation. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to put out to the audience that I think we've reached our conclusion time. And I'd like to um, hope that you have really enjoyed and learned from this past hour and a half um, it's a tricky arrhythmia. Um, it's a arrhythmia that causes people a lot of fuss and difficulty, or it doesn't cause them much fuss at all. And our job is to try to enable you all out there with this type of problem to live life as best you can, uh, take good care of yourself with good health, try and make some changes into your lifestyle if necessary, um, and enjoy every day that you've got. Uh, I, I hope that you all appreciate the tremendous amount of um, inquiry, assessment, analytics, uh, decision-making that we do as cardiologists and as arrhythmia specialists to guide each and every one of you. And I think that we've given you some insight in terms of the fairly vast degree of um, options and treatment plans and categories of medicines, of behavior, of lifestyle issues and of procedural work that can help move you along forward in life. Um, so thank you for attending and thank you, Michael and Tafiri and Raj for taking the time to do this as well. Any closing comments from either of you or did I say enough for all of us? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>